Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Byfield Parish. We're glad that you're with us here on this chilly winter morning. Nice and bright out, though, and that's a good thing. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we start our worship time together. This Tuesday night, I'm sorry, yes, this Tuesday coming is the next council meeting at 7 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. <clears throat> the council reports will be available uh, out in the narthex for those of you who like to be up on that. Anybody is welcome to come to council. Uh, only those members of council will actually vote on any action items that might come before the group. Adventure days are three weeks away now. Uh, during February school vacation, we'll be celebrating an outreach effort, making cards and hot chocolate bombs for the folks over at Trestle Way. There's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. And so if you'd like to be part of that, please let Amelia know so that she'll have the necessary supplies on hand for us for that morning. Also, I have uh, Mrs. Boylan has an announcement for us. Thank you. Good morning. Nice to see you all. If you would, in your bulletin, take out the piece of paper that's a flyer, then um, it will be in your hand as a tangible item of what I'm talking about. Now, I haven't been to Haiti, so I can't talk about Haiti, but I can talk about Brian more. And I want to, I want to tell you about him and what Byfield Parish did in his life to make him who he is today. Brian K. grew up in Rowley, had a very difficult beginning with his family, came to this church and found Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and gave his life to the Lord to be used as ever the Lord would see fit. He is very appreciative of the men in this church who encouraged him and helped him. I just spoke to him the other day, and especially John Trudell, who I was hoping would be here and hear me say that, that he had particularly spent time with uh, Brian. So he was called to go to seminary by our Lord Jesus Christ, and he went to Gordon Conwell. And at that time, he was one of our youth pastors. That, and then he went on to another church because the UCC wanted him to have experience other than William Boylan. And so he did, but he came back and he really was in charge of the field workers. And some of you that were here a long time ago remember that we had field workers here for a few years um, each and he was in charge of them, and he did a tremendous job. So you think of how he influenced their lives because of the people who in this church influenced him. And then he went on to be the pastor in, a, in Pennsylvania, and then he went up to Vermont and into New Hampshire. So he's been a pastor for 40 years. Now he got, and I'm not sure how, just how he got interested in Haiti, but he's been going to Haiti, and when I saw it on Facebook, I said, we have not helped him in any way. He has not come back and asked us. And I feel guilty that I haven't brought it before you before. But anyway, here I am to tell you that Brian is a man of God. He got his training in the Byfield Parish Parsonage when we went to Greece and asked he and Jennifer, his wife, to come and stay with our children. And I guess before we were even out of Boston, Alexander turned the corner and banged his head and had to go in and have stitches. I heard that the cat had an infection in his eye and had to go to the vet. And Andrew ran away. But they found him in the car, in the parking lot, after they went everywhere else looking for him. I think that was good training for all the things that he's had to go through going to Haiti. He went with us to Panayo Bible Conference, and I'm going to tell you, this is his heart. There was a, a mission advertisement or, or talk for us to give a little extra for something. And um, afterward, Jennifer came to me in tears and said, 
Miriam, I gotta tell you, Brian took all our money and gave it to that mission. And what am I gonna do? That's our grace grocery money for the next week. That's how we were gonna get home with gas from Panayo Bible Conference, which is in the Adirondacks. And I said, don't worry, God will provide. Because Brian felt in his heart that he was to empty his wallet to, for the Lord's work. That's the kind of man he is. So he's going to Haiti. I, I asked him if I could go with him. And he said, you'd be scared. I said, I've been to India and Africa. I think I won't be scared. He said, yes, you would. And 15 missionaries, maybe you heard it on the news, were kidnapped and ransomed for a lot of money. And it took a while to get them back home again. Haiti's not a pleasant place, but he's going. And as this says, he was the first white man on this hill in this village that they'd ever seen. He told the guys, he said, let's go to this field. And he gathered them and said, come on, let's go to the field. And when they out, out to the field, he said, well, come on, give me your ball. Let's play ball. We have no ball. The whole community had no ball. If you can dig in your pocketbook and if you could give, so buy some of the things that are all listed here for you. I appreciate it and so would Brian. And Bill and I are going up on the 21st to New Hampshire where he's in Northwood and deliver him. And I hope the basket out in the Nosex will be full. Thank you for your generosity. And the Lord bless you as he's blessed Brian and me. Thank you. Thanks for that encouraging uh, challenge, Miriam. And uh, let's all well pray about that. Um, our call to worship today, I thought we'd do something a little different. This is, as you know, Communion Sunday. A lot of times in the church, one of the traditions is that you would affirm your faith in preparation for taking communion. <clears throat> to that end, let me encourage you to pick up your hymn book at this moment and turn it to 717 way in the back where you'll find the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> 717 in the back, the Nicene Creed. And then I'm going to invite you to stand and we'll affirm our faith together and then we'll remain standing uh, as we sing our praise songs together. So if, once you can find 717 way in the back, let me encourage you to stand up and then I'll know you found it. Excellent. All right. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's continue on our worship as we sing together.
Let's continue in worship as we pray together. Let me invite you to bow your heads. And I'll pray. Holy God, our praise can never match the wondrous measure of your mercy. Our lips can never express the depth of gratitude that our hearts feel. In your providence, we have been kept of your bounty we have received, and under the shadow of your wings, our souls have learned to rejoice. You have led us through each decision of our lives. Your goodness and mercy have followed us all our days. By green pastures we have been led. In the dark valley we have not walked alone. Our comfort has been in your rod and staff. We thank you that we are made to be dependent, that none of us can live without you. But most of all, we thank you that you are dependable, naming us one by one, knowing each of our needs and supplying all that we require and more out of your eternal mercy. Hear us, O oh God, as our hearts, at their best and at their humblest, give you the glory that belongs to your name. We pray for First Congregational Church of Georgetown. We pray that they would rediscover the joy of personal relationship with you, that they would see and understand with fresh perspective what it means to answer the call of discipleship. We pray that revival would come upon that congregation and that a fresh wind of your Holy Spirit would indwell of the fellowship there. We pray for Pastor Boylan and the signpost ministry. We pray that God's word does not return empty, but instead touches and changes the lives of listeners and reaches those in need of God's hope and love. We pray for those members of the church family who are struggling with disease and symptoms associated with disease. We pray for restoration for the sick, strength for those who are weak, trusting hearts for those who are losing hope, confidence for those who fear, and peace for those who are mourning. Let us as a church body look for ways in which we can minister to those who find themselves consumed by the cares of this world. We ask that you would fill Pastor Fugate with your spirit this morning and that the words that go forth from this pulpit would bring you honor and praise. Give him clarity of thought and conviction in his words. May we leave here knowing that we have encountered the living and true God. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus as we sing together the words of the prayer that he taught us.
continue our worship now with an opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper and meet around this table. In preparation for that, let me read you the words of the institution as they're recorded by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For often as you drink this bread, and eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. With that admonition, let's take a few moments of quiet reflection as Holly plays for us to prepare our hearts to receive this communion service together. Lord God, in the stillness of this moment, we invite you to come in a special way with us this morning. Remind us again of the sacrifice that you offered for us on the cross, for the sins that you bore in your body, for the blood that was spilt. Give us a profound realization of just how great your love is for us as we celebrate this sacrament together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord took the bread, and when he had broken it, he said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same present and even those that will commit in the future are already covered because of the satisfaction of that sin. What an amazing love. What an amazing gift that you would pour out your blood for us to offer atonement for the many sins that we commit. Lord, give us hearts that are grateful, minds that are full of our love for you, and hearts that overflow to our community in need of a Savior. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue our time of worship by singing together. We'll turn to hymn number four, How Great Thou Art. Let me invite the boys and girls up through grade four to head on downstairs for a junior church as we sing together hymn number four.
great to be here with all of you today worshiping. It's a privilege to be here with all of you today worshiping. My name is Brent Fugate. I'm the senior pastor here at Byfield Parish Church. If you're visiting here with us the first time, uh, or I haven't met you before. So if I haven't met you before, I would love to have that opportunity. I was thinking this week about how much I do not like unknowns. The more a particular piece of information impacts my life, the more certainty I would like to have regarding that piece of information. For the past year or so, I've been dealing with a car issue. My wife and I, we got a new car about a year ago, and it was supposed to be a reliable car. We were excited about that, and it has been anything but. And there's this, this constant cloud of uncertainty that sort of hangs over me with this car, because I'm just always thinking, when is the next thing going to break? And sometimes I think to myself, I wish, I wish it would just totally break. I wish the car would just totally break down because then at least I could have certainty about what to do next. When it comes to the in unknowns that really impact my life, I want to know the information that will do away with the unknown yesterday. The stress people experience when they feel uncertainty is real. I found this to be repeatedly true during my time working as a nurse. The person that is waiting on biopsy results to come back struggles to think about anything else. Research indicates that the most anxiety-filled time is when a patient is waiting to hear their results. My personal experience backs this up. The person waiting to hear the results of a test is often more stressed than the person that actually knows they have cancer or some other serious disease. The person who knows they have cancer will start to make a plan. But you can't make a plan without the necessary information. All you can do is continuously mull over the possibilities. The more certainty a person has, the less anxious they will normally be. This is true in medicine. It is true in all areas of life. Unfortunately, we live in a world where certainty is elusive. We frequently find ourselves dealing with unknowns, and the longer we live, in that unpleasant state, the more our feelings of despair tend to increase. The anxiety of not knowing wears down our emotional resources. Broadly, in our society, people are doing worse than they were a few years ago mentally. And this is a result, a partial result, of the prolonged period of uncertainty we have all lived through. Today we return to the second chapter of Exodus. The people of Israel have been living in an unpleasant unknown without certainty for generations. Their chronic anxiety in response to the situation they're in has turned into a palpable despair. We'll begin reading in the 22nd verse of chapter 2 and read through verse 25, this very brief section of Scripture. Hear the word of the Lord. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Amen. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. God knows about the despair of the Israelites. 
He hears it and sees it. God knows what has led to their despair. He knows the unknowns that are at its root and the future unknowns that will alleviate it. God knows all. He knows what the Israelites didn't then. He knows the unknowns that make us anxious now. For us, the desire to know is never ending. God knows what we wish we did, and God acts perfectly on his certain knowledge. God, knowing all the unknowns we wish we knew, is the solution to the anxiety and to sometimes the despair that those unknowns make us feel. The first thing to notice from today's passage is that time is passing. Verse 23 says, During those many days, the king of Egypt died. You can hear the weariness of the narrator in his word choice. Time is not passing quickly. It is a truism that when things are going well, time passes quickly. My kids are 13, 11, 9, and 6. They all have spring birthdays. It is unbelievable to me that they are the ages they are. Like most parents, I can still remember, you know, sitting on the floor, stacking blocks. I can remember feeding them bottles. And it feels like it all just happened yesterday. I've enjoyed being a father tremendously. That enjoyable experience has flown by. When life is going poorly, on the other hand, time drags on. For the PhD program I am doing down at Boston College, I have to drive down to Newton on a weekly basis. And often I hit traffic. Every minute I spend in traffic feels like five minutes. It, it drags on. Waiting in unpleasant circumstances is hard. Doing so is even harder when you don't know how long the unpleasant unpleasantness will last. The Israelites have been waiting for a long time in bad circumstances. Many days have passed by. There's no end in sight. For the Israelites enslaved in Egypt, the time that has passed has not even brought relief with it. Time is supposed to heal all wounds, but their wounds are still an open sore. The evil pharaoh of Egypt that enacted the, gen the genocidal policy of killing children has died. Any hope his death would bring relief has been disappointed. The issues in Egypt are not the result of a single evil person. The problems are institutional. Whoever is in charge, the results are basically the same for the Hebrews. There is no end in sight. People can bear a lot if they know when relief will come. Hope motivates perseverance. In this situation, hope is in short supply. They can see no reason to hope. Tomorrow will probably be the same as today, and the next day will be no different. This is how it has been for them for their whole lives. The, the many days of suffering caused the people of Israel to groan because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. Groaning happens within a person. Victims groan. It's an expression of helplessness and despair. I'm not normally a big fan of groaning. I tend to think it's a waste of energy that should be applied to problem solving. It 
It doesn't really seem to accomplish anything. That's an incredibly privileged position to be able to hold. My attitude towards groaning reflects the fact that I've never really been in a situation where I didn't have some way to improve my lot. The Hebrews are in a situation where groaning is all they can do. They are groaning for good reason. They are slaves. They have no power to change their circumstances for the better. In addition to groaning, the Jews cry out. Whereas groaning is more internal, crying out is external. Crying out only makes sense if someone who cares can hear you. The Jews are not sure there is. Notice it doesn't say they cried out to God. Their plea is more general in nature. They're just just hoping somebody, something is out there. It is an act of sheer desperation. They are a drowning man using his final breath to yell out as they sink into the abyss. The Israelites cry for rescue from slavery, came up to God. God was never absent. In times of distress, when we are groaning and crying out, God may feel far away. The Israelites' cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. The implication for many when they read this is that God is above the fray in heaven looking down. Ancient people associated the heavens with authority. The intent of saying cries went up to God is to show that God rules over all. Unfortunately, it makes many people think that God is also distant. Even when our suffering is internal, God knows. Most people are pretty good at keeping up a brave face for the outside world. We don't want to be objects of pity. People build a persona that they show to the world to protect their true self. God sees past our defenses into our groaning hearts. God is authoritative over all creation. He is not distant from human distress. He heard the cries of the Hebrews. He hears your cries as well. The problem is never that God is not there. Sometimes the problem is that we are not desperate enough to call out to him. Until his death, a little over a decade ago, there was a man named Bob Rudolph who attended Byfield Parish Church. Many of you all knew him. I never had the pleasure of getting to know Bob. Our paths didn't cross. His widow Nancy and uh, three children, Kelly, Grace, and John, uh, three of, you have more children, but the three that still go here, In addition to being a lawyer, Bob would sometimes act as a sailboat captain. He would retrieve boats that had been taken down to the Caribbean, and he would return them to New England. And on one of these trips, there was a massive storm. It was him and a crew on the boat that he was kind of training, and there was this massive storm. And in that moment, it really felt like all was lost, that the boat was going to go down. And in that moment of desperation, Bob cried out to God. And he felt God's presence in the storm. I was talking to Bob's son John about this briefly this week, and he said the people on the boat didn't really know what Bob was doing, because in the midst of this storm, Bob after he felt this peace from God, 
was responding with this, with this joy that basically he was dancing around on the boat and the other people on the boat were like, wow, we, we really are. We really are in trouble here. Humans are resistant to truly crying out to God. I've seen this with people struggling with an addiction that is destroying their lives. They don't want to call out to God. They know that when a person calls out to God, is it an admission that they have no control? When you cry out for rescue, you can't bargain with your rescuers. You have to be truly desperate. In these verses, the people were desperate. God heard their cries. He heard the groans of the Hebrews. He was aware of what was going on in the hearts of the people. This would have been stunning to them. Part of their groaning is that they felt alone, but they are not alone. God is not distant. He is present with them. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some might read that God remembered and wonder how God could forget. This is one of those times that we should not be confused by anthropomorphic language. For those of you that don't remember elementary school very well, anthropomorphism is the use of words that describe people to describe something else. Normally it's used to describe animals. Simba, Mufasa, Scar, and all of the other talking lions from the Lion Kings are their examples of anthropomorphic animals. The Bible uses anthropomorphic language to describe God. Our, our language falls short of really being able to communicate who God is, what God is. So to talk about God, we have to use human terms that can't fully communicate what God is doing. God had never forgotten Israel's plight in the way you or I routinely forget an item at the grocery store or misplace our keys at home. He did not get distracted by other things on his to-do list. Israel is not a $20 bill God discovered in a pair of pants he hadn't worn for a while. Without God, excuse me, it is important to know, it is important for us to know that God is present. That he has not forgotten us, even when we are in the midst of our times of anxiety and despair related to the unknowns of this world. Knowledge of God is a bulwark against despair. Pre-COVID, I was part of a nonfiction book club. I've mentioned this before. It It was a club, and I was I was the only Christian in it. We would read different books. We read Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance and Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker and a lot of books in between. And as the only Christian, it was, it was interesting to have these conversations. There was one guy in the group in particular who was an atheist. And it was always striking to me in talking with this incredibly intelligent man what his beliefs meant for him. I felt sorry for him, not because he was wrong, although he was. I felt sorry for him because he lacked hope. When it came down to it, his lack of belief in anything besides what he could see was a recipe for hopelessness. Without God, we should despair. Sooner or later, the world we live in will fall into non-existence left to purely physical mechanisms. 
Without God, love and justice are just myths people believe to make life a little more bearable. All anyone can do is make the time they have in this world more enjoyable. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The Israelites' despair was exacerbated by their lack of awareness of who God is. They don't even have the solace of enjoying their few decades on earth. Their lives are short and brutal. While Christians today are not as bad off as my atheist friend, I wonder how much different we are than the Israelites were in their distress. I speak with a lot of Christians who don't seem to believe that God remembers his covenant people. It's not that they don't believe in God. They do, or at least they say they do. It is more a lack of belief that God hears their cries and cares enough to act. Verse 25 is really striking. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Let that sit with you for a moment. It's an incredibly simple sentence. There's no flowery language. No extra words are used. The sentence makes a straightforward claim. God saw. God knew. Today, God sees. God knows. The statement leaves unanswered the information everyone would like to have. What will God do? Moses doesn't know. He's off tending sheep in the wilderness. The people of Israel don't know. They're suffering under taskmasters' whips. We normally don't know either. We don't know what God knows, not even close. Even if we did, we still wouldn't understand. Our grasp of God's knowledge would be tainted by our own sin. We would likely rebel against it. God's complete knowledge always results in perfect action. Prior to these verses in Exodus, God has not been mentioned once. It's not that he isn't present and active. We talked two weeks ago about how God was at work even through forces that were opposed to him. At the time, that was the best move. Moving forward in Exodus, God's activity will be more obvious. He will speak to Moses through the burning bush, bring plagues upon Egypt, split the Red Sea, and provide for Israel in the desert. Whether God's action is obvious or hidden, God is always active. We live in a time where God's action seems more hidden. In our future, it, it may be more obvious to us. Whatever the case may be, God's action is a product of his perfect knowing. He knows every variable. His thinking is not probabilistic. He is not like a weatherman making educated guesses. God knows the future in the same complete way he knows the present and the past. A variable God prioritizes is how his people are doing. God's knowledge and action is influenced by the love he has for his people. He is not some deistic computer in the sky determining outcomes. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. 
God sees you and God knows. We cannot know the unknowns that would alleviate the anxiety in our life. We can know the knower of all the unknowns. We can know God. This is actually much better than knowing what the results of what a biopsy will be. When a car will break next or if traffic will let up. Even if we knew the answer to those unknowns, there's always another unknown thing. There are more tests. Another bill to pay or some other unpleasantness. Even if we knew everything, we wouldn't be able to address it. God's knowledge results in perfect action. He hears and sees. We can have hope in the perfect knowledge of the Lord. He will act on behalf of his people. His actions may not be obvious to us, but he is acting. We can have patience with the slow passage of time due to the certainty we have in God. Our anxiety is unnecessary, as is our despair. God sees, knows, and acts. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you would be with us. There are those listening to this sermon physically here today or or watching online that are dealing with levels of anxiety that they find crippling in their lives, Lord. God knows that anxiety. God cares. And it may be easy to to recognize that in some sort of intellectually distant way, but living that out on a daily basis is a challenge, Lord. There's always new reasons for anxiety and and reasons to despair for some, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would turn our anxiety over, over to you, that we would turn our despair over to you, that in knowing you, we would be able to find rest and peace. And Lord, when it comes to all the unpleasantness, all the unknown things that our burdens in our lives, Lord. I I pray that you would resolve those things. I pray that you would deal with them. We are not as bad off as the Israelites were, but we do have real concerns in our lives, Lord. I pray that you would act to bring about a conclusion to those sources of anxiety. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We will now stand and sing together hymn number 26, which is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Hymn number 26.
may be seated. I can uh, corroborate with that story that Pastor Brent talked about, Bob Rudolph. Uh, he shared with us that uh, it was Hurricane Bob he was going through. And uh, he knew that they were in trouble when he saw a, uh, a seagull land in the stern of the boat. And it looked like it had gone through a storm. It was windblown and exhausted. And so um, he went below decks and uh, cried out to God. And uh, Jesus Christ showed up, calmed his fears, and took him right through that storm. So just, uh, just remember that story. Um, the opposite of fear of the unknown is faith. And there's going to be a time when we will see our object of our faith in person. So that's good news. So um, um, after the service, there'll be some deacons and elders that uh, will be available for prayer. If you just want to say hi, and uh, they'll be more than happy to talk with you. And uh, as we leave the sanctuary, our gifts and offering, offerings will be out in the narthex. And so with that, let's uh, rise for the benediction comes from John 14, 1 through 3. Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. What an encouragement. All right, go in peace. Mm -hmm.